Yes. Welcome to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of FlagandBanner.com. Through storytelling and conversational interviews, this weekly radio show and podcast offers listeners an insider's view into starting and running a business, the ups and downs of risk-taking, and the commonalities of successful people. Connect with Carrie through her candid, often funny, and always informative weekly blog. There, you'll read, learn, and make comment about her life as a 21st century wife, mother, daughter, and entrepreneur. And now it's time for Carrie McCoy to get all up in your business. Thank you, Sun Gray. If right now you're sitting at your computer, you might want to watch the show on flagandbanner.com's Facebook page. I'm waving at everybody. It's kind of fun to see what goes on behind the scenes. My guest just waved too. Gray, did you wave? Good. Okay, good. <laughs> this show, Up in Your Business with Carrie McCoy, began as a calling. After four decades of running a small business, I felt I had something to share. I wanted to create a platform for not just me, but for other business owners and successful people to pay forward their experiential knowledge in a conversational way. Originally, my team and I thought it would take, it would be easy. It would take about an hour or two a week, but we were wrong. Um, this is This hour a week has turned into much, much more. As with every endeavor, every new endeavor it's harder than you first think once again i find myself on the onset of starting and running yet another new business this podcast and doing exactly what this show is about creating a new business taking risks and working hard podcasts are the new business after interviewing over 100 successful people i've noticed some reoccurring traits among many of my guests belief in a higher power the heart of a teacher creativity because business is creative before we start i want to let you know if you miss any part of today's show or want to hear it again or share it there's a way and gray will tell you how listen to all uiyb past and present interviews by going to flag and banner.com and clicking on radio show or subscribe to our podcasts wherever you like to listen by searching up in your business with carrie mccoy Also, you may simply like FlagandBanner.com's Facebook page to watch our live stream and receive timely notifications of upcoming guests. Back to you, Carrie. Thank you, Gray. Well, my tech just came in here and said the live Facebook feed is down. Is it still down? Yes. Okay, never mind. We were waving at nobody. Um, We may get it up here soon, though, at FlagandBanner.com's Facebook page in a minute. Uh, If you visited arkansas or live in arkansas then there is a good chance that you have patronized one of my guests establishment mr frank fletcher jr owns restaurants steakhouses car lots wyndham riverfront hotel fletcher realty and fletcher fur but the first company he founded that he cut his teeth on was cheyenne silverwood industries this little startup that fletcher founded in his garage grew to become the largest lamp company in the united states he expanded its manufacturing to taiwan and mainland china and grew this business to over 100 million in annual sales before selling the company in december of 2010 in preparation for this interview i began writing a paragraph that just grew too long so to paint a quick picture or a quicker picture of how interesting this man is i just made some bullet points and they are he was adopted he grew up on a farm in Tamo, Arkansas, with a population of five. He married his high school sweetheart. At the age of 14, he was six feet, four inches tall. Frank's a graduate of the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville and a fraternity brother of Dallas Cowboy owner Jerry Jones. After college, he joined the Army. After the Army, he supplemented his income where he was working at Worthen Bank by working at Shakey's Pizza Parlor. That's going to bring up a lot of memories for people. He met Mr. Sam Walton at Walmart Number 2 in Harrison, Arkansas, and he owns racehorses, all with some variation of the name Rocket for his once-beloved dog, Rocket. It's not every day you get the opportunity to sit down with a self-made millionaire and hear how it all unfolded. It is a pleasure to welcome to the table the tall, hardworking, intuitive businessman and philanthropist Mr. Frank Fletcher. Hello. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. We've had a great time talking before the show. Yes, we have. Uh, 
Toma, Arkansas. I did not ask you about this before the show. Population five. Is that true? That's my, when my grandmother was there. Yeah, it was just a, we had a water tank, a cotton gin, and a, what we call a general store. We were farmers, and uh, I worked in the cotton gin, drove tractors, and that was how that I was able to graduate. My father said, you know, you, my, your mom and I, neither one, have been to school, so you're the only child you're going to go to college, and if you make a C, you will be back here in this cotton gin the rest of your life. So they forced me to uh, study some at school. So it was a little bit out of fear that I got out of school in four years. So not being smart, but I didn't want to go back to Tamo. Tamo, is that Tamo. how you say it? Yeah. Is it Tamo still, a- still, I mean, people pass, when you go to uh, Florida, you all, everybody drives by Tamo, you see the water tower. It's about... 25 miles south of Pine Bluff on the way to Grady. You're going down to Grady, Dumas, uh, Lake Village. You go right by Tamo. Who put up the water tower? I don't know. It was there when uh, when when I first remember it, but it was been there been there a long time. It, it was just uh, a lot of people that were in the farming business. But we, uh, my my parents moved there uh, in the uh, early early 50s, I guess, and. Uh, uh, you know, I, I remember growing up and riding horses and just, you know, ha- I went to Grady until I was uh, 10th grade and uh, they asked me to come play basketball in Pine Bluff. So that was an opportunity for me to get a car carry. And so I never was a star in Pine Bluff, but at Grady, I was all state every year because I was a lot taller. That was n- no talent, just tall. That's good. You could just set the basketball into the net. Yeah, I could I could get it in there. What age but, were you adopted? I was adopted when I was two or three weeks old. And uh, back in that time, I understand you just went to the doctor and kind of showed them your driver's license and uh, asked them if they had any babies. So it wasn't a long process, you know, like it is today. So, uh, you know, I've been asking many times, have you ever tried to find your real parents? And the answer is no, because, you know, the people that adopted me were my parents. And I had a wonderful wonderful life so uh, that was never a concern but i i do like to talk you know when i when i'm asked about being adopted because there are many kids that are adopted that really are afraid to talk about it or, or think that they're different or something and i just I, I always say man you're lucky yeah <laughs> that's right i would uh i would when i read that you're adopted and i first thing i thought was have you contacted your parents and then i thought boy that could open up a can of worms because i have had friends find their parents for too. health reasons right. you know they want to know their genetics health reasons and so i bet if you found your parents and they found out that you were a self-made millionaire they would be like oh darn i can't believe i gave that baby away <laughs> well i always tell uh, my friends when we're laughing i go i know my dad worked in new orleans as a hawker out in front of the strip clubs because you know, I'm I'm a, a pretty loud, and uh, oh, I always. I thought you were going to say because I like myself. to go to no, strip clubs. No, I just always <laughs> I always say, come on in, buy something. So I figured that, that has something to do with my DNA. Oh yeah, you are a salesman. The salesman from day one. You got your uh, your degree from uh, the University of Arkansas in business, and you pledged. I pledged Cap Sig and. Had some great, great friends that I, you know, they're still around. And Jerry Jones and I were uh, friends, and and you know, I've I've been lucky enough to maintain that friendship and get to go uh, on a lot of you know trips with him and NFL uh, locker football? rooms and uh, you know special places because of his kindness. So that's been a you know an extra treat. But I had, just have so many friends. This guy here in town named Charlie Whiteside, and when. He, he was from Fort Smith, and I'm from Tamo, and he said, Buddy, what are you doing at school? And I had no idea. He said, Well, the first thing we're going to do is burn all your clothes because <laughs> my mother had sent me with black and white shoes and a black and white belt and, you know, some really corny she- uh, clothes. So the fraternity burned all my clothes on my arrival, and then they took me downtown and bought all new clothes. So. <laughs> What were you supposed to have? Blue jeans? Oh, or something? I don't know. I, was, I, think, I think she went to Pfeiffer's and thought she was dressing me up. And, uh, I must have looked pretty funny because they had a bonfire, and we we've laughed about that ever since. And Charlie went to work for Merrill Lynch, and uh, uh, kind of took care of whatever money I made. So he's been a great friend, and, and here still here in Little Rock. That's uh-huh. probably why you are so such a great alumni to the University of Arkansas. I read a lot about how you really love the University of Arkansas and have done a lot to support them. We we you know it's just it's one of the great things that happened to me and. I got a chance a few years ago with Jerry 
Jerry contributes a little money, and, and I, I said, to, they said, the university people said to me, Frank, what, what would you do different if you were going to school? And I went, well, I really didn't learn anything about real business, you know, when I was there. So we got together and started a, a, a class for students called SAKE, S-A-K-E, Students Acquiring Knowledge Through Enterprise. And it's we've been doing it about, I don't know, eight or nine years now. And the SAKE class actually runs, gets credit, and uh, tons of people want to sign up for it. And they run a business where they sell stuff on the Internet, take, take credit cards, take returns. So they, they're actually operating a profit for business, and they're able to get all the alumni names that most people couldn't get. So they sell merchandise on the Internet and learn how the accounting process, but mainly the marketing process. So, you know, I would have given anything to take a class like that. Uh, you mean they actually have products that they sell they, in the they class? They actually have products. I, I sent the first class over to China, and uh, we had moved from Taiwan over to China. We had our own factories in mainland China. So I sent the first class with uh, with some chaperones, and then we took them through factories over there. And they they have come back and talked to all the other classes, those kids that have gone on and graduated, and we, we just kind of opened our eyes to what could be made overseas. And so then we developed products, uh, and uh, we, we have some domestic products too. So you so, develop products with that class with that, that class, are being made and then they in sell China, them to alumni. And, then, and then there's, oh my For gosh. instance, like, like the sidewalk has all the graduates on it, so they, they sell a picture of Old Main and then your name inscripted on fall. Uh, in a beautiful four-inch frame, and it, it's a, one of their number one sellers. So I guess so. They custom make it for everyone that orders from. Whose idea so. was that? Well, it, it's just yours. A little bit of idea. Oh, so. he's grinning. If everybody so. can't see, it's your idea. <laughs> but it, you know, that's that's been one of my real pleasures that's a to, is to help the school a little bit. That, that is a real money maker. I bet. Well, it's. You know, I want it to, each time they ask me, what else can you do for us? I go, you keep expanding this class, and I'll figure out a way to to Aww, do more. So, you know, it's a, about 400 people apply, and only 32 get in. Wow. So a lot of kids want to be in that That's class. That's less than 10%. Yeah, yeah it's not. They need, they need to have more, more teachers. You know, it's just something different than books. You know, people don't realize we, we talked about this right at the intro how creative business is and you just told the most creative great business story about why people love business why people that are in business like you love it because of the and they, creativity and they need some it. experience in college they don't need to wait till they go out on their first interview because you know i went to work for oil and bank because i just i couldn't find a job and i only worked there i walked down to the unemployment bureau and said do you can you find me a job and they found me a job with dupont and so my first call at 22 years old, I called on a guy named Sam Walton. And I always say adoption number one, meeting Sam Walton number two, Sam Walton number two, when I was a very young person, he was my first uh, first call I made. And this, this is a good story. I walked in to see him. Of course, he was right there in the store, you know. And uh, I said, he said, who are, you know, who are you and what do you have? And I said, I've got Lucite paint. He said, oh, my goodness, we'd love to have a brand name. And I said, well, you know, I'd like to sell you 300 gallons. And he said, how much is it? And I said, $1,500. And he said, no, I'm not paying $1,500. So we talked a little bit. And he said, come on, go to the, I think it was the Lions Club. So he takes me as a young kid, and I guess he was 38 or 40. So we go to this luncheon. He's passing yellow pads back and forth to me. And he goes, I don't want 300 gallons. I want 50 gallons. And I said, I'll lose. The only other customer DuPont has and Harrison, if if you buy it. So anyway, after much arguing, I went to a pay phone because we didn't have mobile phones then. And uh, I got him 120 days dating. I pushed it across the table on the yellow pad, and he said, what does that mean? And I said, it means you don't have to pay for it for four months. So I finally got an order. $1,500? $1,500. And I, Spaced so I started, out over four months. That, that was, uh, he didn't have to pay for it, so you know, it was sold. And people don't realize that Walmart was begging for merchandise in those days. But the factories, you know, he sent me. So anyway, to make a long story short, after about six months, he said, I want you to quit DuPont. I want you to become a manufacturer's rep. And I said, I don't know what that is. He said, well, you'll go to work on a commission and just go ask people to sell their products. So I said, where would I go? And he said, Chicago. And I said, how do I get there? And he said, you get on a train in Memphis that stops in St. Louis. And so I got off in Chicago, but he forgot to tell me to wear a coat. And it was about 30 <laughs> below on the lake. So my contacts 
stuck to my eyeballs and i knew i was in chicago <laughs> so i went to a place called the navy pier which had all the merchandise it's, it's a famous tourist place now but it used to be a merchandising mart and i walked up to everybody and said i'm frank fletcher i'd like to represent your company and i came home with about 50 companies of junk you know but anyway i started calling on all the walmart stores you sold each store individually and by that time he had opened 15 or 20 so that was the start of my so wait, he 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 hires you away from DuPont. He pried me away from DuPont. He, he makes you a, a rep for him. I left my six hundred dollar salary, which I was very proud of. That's right. And now I wasn't working for Walmart. I was. Working and that was six hundred a month. Company. Let's just say that was yeah, six hundred a, a month. So I went to work for companies that paid me a commission only if I sold something. So no salary. I gotcha. So so. Uh, so anyway, you. But you're, I thought you said when he hired you away, you became a sales rep for. No, not for Walmart. For oh. I was a manu- what, they, what they call a manufacturer's rep, which means we represented different companies. Like if you had a company and I was selling your flags, so you'd pay had- me a commission if I sold one. If, if I didn't sell anything, I was of no cost to you. You're kind of like a buyer for him. No, you- not really. Just, just I was just one of many, many salesman calling on walmart selling products except i didn't work for one company i worked for multiple companies did you get to keep your dupont job no, no. you had to completely give up your six hundred dollars you had to, give up my job you had to and, take uh, this big risk yeah, so that, of going was, out. that was a first big risk and uh, there are not manufacturer reps like that anymore oh well there are a few of them but not not many but it's it's a commission job and mm-hmm. that's i always love commission and today everyone that works for me I, I pay very low salaries and high commissions because I think that if you can reach for the stars, no one needs to put a cap on what you can make. Uh, so, so even like people that are managers at my restaurant, for instance, we give them goals to hit. If they hit those goals, they keep making more and more bonuses. So you know what? They don't close at 10 o'clock when the door says 10 o'clock. They stay open till 11 o'clock. But it's just I've always believed Smart. in never telling someone this is your salary and this is all you can make. I always say, make as much as you want, as hard as you want to work. And so that, you know, has always been good for me. And then, uh, Kerry, Mr. Walton fired me when I was about 28. He called me and he said, Frank, come in my office. And I said, well, sir, what's wrong? He said, well, there's nothing wrong with you. We're going to get rid of all the manufacturer's reps. But you didn't work for him. No, but he, when he said fire me, that, that is kind of confusing. He said, you're no longer going to have a job. Walmart is going to contact all the companies that you and all the other people represent. And we're going to tell those companies, we want them to give us your commission. In other words, if I was selling it to him for a dollar, he would get them to sell it to him for 95 cents, you see, and, Mm -hmm. and Frank would lose that. So I said, well, Mr. Walton, I got two kids and a wife, and I've been working, you know, for a long time for it's your stores. And he said, you got paid for every day, son. He was, he was real nice. I said, I'm thinking about suicide. And he said, well, go out in the front <laughs> lobby. Don't do it here in my office. <laughs> and I said, you know, it's not really funny. <laughs> so anyway, he said, go home and rent a garage and uh, make something. I'll try to buy it from you. And I said, Mr. Walton, I can barely turn the key in my car. I'm not very inclined. So uh, I did. I went home and rented a garage. And, and that was the birth of Cheyenne which was a lamp company. All, we didn't make anything. We just assembled parts. We bought parts, and we actually made shades. So you know something about sewing. We bought sewing machines, and we sewed our own shades. But we bought all the parts from all over, and we assembled them. And so we started, and Mr. Walton bought the lamps. And when other people would leave Walmart and go to Target, I'd follow them to Target. When they went to Kmart, I followed them there. When we went to Lowe's or Home Depot, I followed people that left Walmart all over the United States. So I broadened my territory from Arkansas to the USA. Oh, my gosh. That's a lot of great stories. This is a great place to take a break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Mr. Frank Fletcher, Jr., entrepreneur extraordinaire. We'll, We'll hear the story of his first business that he's just talking about, Cheyenne Silverwood Industries. Uh, well, we we heard how it came about, but we're going to hear how he grew it into a hundred million dollar company before selling it in 2010. We'll be back after the break. You're listening to Up in Your Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of FlagandBanner.com. Over 40 years ago, with only four hundred dollars, Carrie founded Arkansas Flag and Banner. During the last four decades, the business has grown and changed, starting with door-to-door sales, then telemarketing, to mail order and catalog sales. And now, 
FlagandBanner.com relies heavily on the internet and live chats with customers all over the world. Over this time, Carrie's business and leadership knowledge has grown. As early as 2004, she began sharing her knowledge in her weekly blog. In 2009, she founded the nonprofit Friends of Dreamland Ballroom, and in 2014, Brave Magazine, a biannual publication. Today, she has branched out into podcasts, Facebook live stream, and YouTube videos of this radio show. Each week, you'll hear candid conversations between her and her guests about real-world experiences on a variety of businesses and topics that we hope you'll find interesting and inspiring. Stay up to date by joining FlagandBanner.com's mailing list. You'll receive our Water Cooler Weekly e-blast that notifies you of our upcoming guests, happenings at Dreamland Ballroom, sales at FlagandBanner.com, access to Brave Magazine articles, and Carrie's current blog post. All that in one weekly email. Or you may simply like FlagandBanner.com's Facebook page for timely notifications. Telling American-made stories, selling American-made flags. The FlagandBanner.com. Back to you, Carrie. You're listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy. I'm speaking today with Mr. Frank Fletcher, founder of a diverse empire of successful businesses, including restaurants, car lots, manufacturing businesses, hotel, and real estate companies. Uh, before the break, we talked about so much stuff. I can't even think of it all uh, about how Mr. Flet- Mr. Fletcher grew up. I just want to call you Frank. Can I just call you Frank? Please. How Frank uh, grew up. Uh, on a farm in Toma or Tama? Tamo. Tamo, Arkansas, uh, population of five, how he worked hard in uh, college, was a Sigma. Capasig. Capasig. Oh, that's the wild ones, isn't it? Yeah, that is the wild one. That's what I thought. I think I dated one of those. Anyway, uh, Capasigs <laughs> and... Um, uh, and then how you went to work for DuPont, then you went to work for Sam Walton, and then how he pulled the rung from out from under you and you were going to commit suicide in the front yard of Walmart, but decided instead to start Cheyenne Silverstone Manufacturing in your garage, in your house. So it sounds like when Sam Walton pulled the rug out from under you uh, that he also funded your venture he said he would buy from you but i think he maybe bought parts for you too no he he uh he just told me if i made something good and if it was for the right price he would buy and i knew what the right price was but he did he did he did help us you know by buying our merchandise and uh why did you pick well i was one of the companies that's a good question one of the companies i represented was a company called jim co lamps in in jonesboro and so I knew about lamps, and I had sold them for a long, long time. So I was really had a big business with, with that company. And uh, I actually went to the owner of that company and asked him if I could make some different kind of product than he made. And uh, uh, he agreed. And he, anyway, that was why I started in the lamp business. And then uh, he agreed. So he, he supplied agreed. You parts? I, kept, I kept selling his product for a while, and I made different kinds of lamps. But eventually, my business started growing good, so I had to resign from his business. But um, I had sold Mr. Walton so many different products over the period of years. And, you know, one of the funny things was uh, that I uh, I taught myself how to ad- to make up ads. Back in these days, we're talking a long time ago, They were Walmart was advertising in newspapers. So I went to a newspaper and said, teach me how to lay out an ad. And they said, okay, if you look at a newspaper... The customer buys, or the customer reads from the top left. So whenever you put an ad in, so if you open up a newspaper like this, he said, you want your products in the top left. I always thought it was the top so, right. No, it's the top left. Oh, darn. So I, uh, I, I would learn how to cut and paste all the products that I had. I would make up an ad, put the Walmart bro- uh, logo on top, and I would cut all my products and put them in the top. And then I would put other products that Walmart had, and I would hand the manager uh a makeup of an ad and they loved it because they didn't have to do it and guess what my stuff was always on the top and mm-hmm. i'll tell you one funny story about mr walton and pricing when i first sold him the paint he said okay i didn't want to buy that much but how much did the the lucite paint cost and i said it cost three dollars and seventy cents he said what are we going to sell it for and i said 397 and he looked at me like i was crazy yeah he, went, he said uh son we can't make any money i said mr sam Please, let me ask you about your toothpaste. 
what do you sell your toothpaste for? And he said, what's that got to do with the paint? And I said, you sell your toothpaste for less than you pay for it. You know why? Because you want to drive everybody in the health community aids, and then they buy all kinds of other stuff. I'm going to make your paint department famous, and then they're going to buy paint brushes, paint, paint and roller sets, and you're going to have the best paint department in the world. And he Lost went, leader. He went, okay. So uh, one of the one of the stories in sales is the, le- the least amount you can sell your product for, the faster it'll sell. In other words, instead of if it was a three ninety seven, it was going to sell a lot faster than if it was five ninety seven. But I've known people to make prices so low they run themselves out of business. Well, he wasn't going to run himself out of business, and all I was doing was was learning from what he had done when he started was the health health mediates for his first big loss leader. So I would just work. I, I would always try to get him to promote my products, mm-hmm. and uh, I'll yeah. tell you a funny story about Mr. Walton. I mean, I could just write a book. He called me one morning about 6.30, and I woke up, and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm asleep. Who is this? And he said, it's Sam Walton, and it scared me. And I said, where are you, Mr. Walton? He said, I'm in Dalton, Alabama. I said, sir, the stores are not open. He said, I got a key in the guard. And he said, don't ask me about where I am. I'm going to pick your item for my, my item for a year's contest. So he picked an item, he told me, and I just got real quiet, and he said, what's wrong? I said, how do I tell you, sir, that's the wrong item? He said, how could it be the wrong item? I picked it. And I said, well, you saw it in Sam's Wholesale, and they work on a 10% markup. You're going to put it in Walmart, and they work on 35% markup. Once we go past the Sam's retail, it's not going to sell millions of dollars that you want it to. He said, okay, pick out another item. So I got to choose an item. And um, anyway, so that was lot, that lot. was long after you had started your business because Sam's Club. Yeah, this is many years later, but yes. just the interaction with him, he he would just so much detail. You know, he asked me to meet him at a tennis court one morning at six o'clock in Dallas, six a.m., and he he wanted me to talk to him about a promotion, and he was constantly, you know, meeting with individual people. It's hard to think back then when you think of what a giant corporation it is now. You yeah, know? and he was just he was always so thinking. so detailed, always, how can we sell more? How can we sell more? And just uh, and a close relationship with everybody, it sounds like. So you picked Cheyenne Silverstone Manufacturing. How did you come up with that name? Well, silver is actually silver wood. We live on 808 Silverwood, so being a smart guy like I was, I looked at the signpost and said, I need a name for a mirror company. Cheyenne, I just always had a fascination about Indians, so anyway, that's that's kind of crazy, but that's how I picked that name. <laughs> but yeah, I picked Silverwood because I could see the sign. And uh, so, so you put them together. Yeah, no, well, I had one company that came after the other. Silverwood was a company where we we uh, made mirrors. We we had an actual mirror machine as long as a football field, and you put glass on it. When it came out at the other end, a hundred yards long, it was mirrors. So it was two different companies, the lamps first and then the mirrors. How long did you do lamps before they were Oh, off? probably five or ten years. I don't know, a long And then time. when did you add the mirrors? And then the mirrors. And then we sold them all as, as one company when we, when we. How long did you work out of your garage in your home? Oh, maybe a year. And uh, I still work today. I work my office in my home. I don't have a garage anymore. But uh, I still, every morning I go downstairs and I have five other people that join me, my son. Being one, he's in business for me in the car business, and we have three other people that support us every day. So you don't like go to sons. an office, yeah, just like my so, sons here. So I don't go to some big building. I go, I go one flight down, and 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 rocket number three. I have a third dog now. They all look like all German shepherds. So rocket number three is sitting there by my desk waiting for the day to start. You don't feel like you need to get up and go to the office. I feel no, like I have know, to well, get up I and go wear, to the office. I can wear. Pajamas. Shorts or whatever I want to downstairs, <laughs> you know. And I don't have to put on a tie to go down. Do you have people come see you? Do you ask invite people? Yes, over? absolutely. Absolutely. We we have we have our uh I just it's always been that way, so I guess I'm just comfortable. Mm-hmm. And uh, You started that way, so you stayed that way. Yeah, so, so now now we're just in you know, we've moved on. We're only in the uh hotel and the restaurants and the but the car business is our main deal, but I got to tell you the way I, what mm-hmm. made me stop being in the lamp business for 30, I don't know how many years, 30 years. I don't know how long I called on Walmart forever. And one day I walked in and this new buyer said, I don't like anything you have. I want to show you some pictures in the magazine. And she was 25 years old. And uh, she showed me pictures and I said, that, that doesn't sell in Walmart. And she said, 
I'm the buyer and you're the seller. Be quiet. So I said, have you ever been to Poto, Oklahoma? And she said, what's that got to do with this conversation? I said, well, you can't sell chrome in Poto. And I said, you can't sell brass in Florida because it the salt water. Right. And so she looked at me and she said, you and I are not going to get along very well. You're going to sell me what I want. So I did. But I wrote her a letter and I wrote the merchandise manager's letter and said, I'm not standing behind these products. I do not believe in them. They're not the right thing. How did it and work she out? bought them anyway. And then uh, she got fired, and six months later, another lady called me and said, hey, I don't like these lamps we have. And I said, you and I are going to get along beautifully. She said, great. <laughs> she said, I want you to take back about $3 million worth. And I went up to Walmart and showed her the letter, and the merchandise managers and the vice president supported me, and I didn't have to take them back. But that was when I decided it was time for me to retire. Was that hard to let go of your baby? Yeah, it was. But I realized that, that I had passed my time, uh, you know, in the early days, what Mr. Walton always did, and the reason that company, not just nothing to do with myself, but for many, many people, Mr. Walton would say, and everybody he personally taught, ask the vendor what their best products are and ask them how we can sell more than our competitors. Very simple. Very simple. And they, they move past that. You know, listening is a lost art form. People don't listen anymore. People, Absolutely. You know, they want to tell you what they like and what they want to do, and they don't listen. And I tell people all the time, listen to your customers. Your customers will tell you what they want. They'll tell you what the trends are. They'll tell you everything. So you decided to um, import. To me, that is the scariest thing in the world. How do you uh, learn the business of importing and the language barriers and come to trust your foreign partners? How did you overcome all of that? Well, I'm glad you asked me those questions because for somebody who's listening tonight, and I hope they're thinking about importing because it is a great business but very dangerous. You already summed it up perfectly. So what I did and what I recommend to anyone else is to find a person who's maybe educated in the United States but at least uh, speaks perfect English, not only speaks it but understands English because a lot of people will say yes to anything you ask them. But I met a young man who went to school in California, but he was a Taiwanese. And he wanted to go back to Taiwan to marry. And so he said, I was young and he was young. I said, his, his name was Frank Wong. And I said, Frank, I want you to be my agent over there. And I want you to find the factories for merchandise I want. I want you to inspect all of the merchandise for quality. I want you to put it on the containers. So he did everything. He was he was my right arm, first in Taiwan, and then Mr. Walter made us move into China. <clears throat> so he made, um, I don't mind saying it, because you're gonna, anybody that's listening to this program, you're going to have to pay an agent. You have to have an honest agent. Mm -hmm. I paid him 3% of everything that he put on the ship. But if something went wrong with it when he got over here, <clears throat> he would go back to the factory and make it right over there. So I can't just call up and say, I'm going to, sue you in mainland china it doesn't work so it's very important that you uh i gotta take a glass of drink of water all right it's very important that no matter what you do is that if someone asks you for a certain pay scale you've got to pay your your agent they're your partner yeah pay them so well you can't pick i mean i went to asia maybe 35 times but I was as lost as they would be if they came down to Tamo and wanted to look at a cotton gin. I mean, <laughs> you know, I didn't know anything about, except that I was just trying to, I was trying to to judge my agent, and I find him to be very credible. He would call us up and he'd say, "You've forgotten we got a price reduction on an item," where he could have cheated me out of that money. So he was a wonderful guy. He's still still alive. He lives and he moved back to Taiwan. How'd you meet this man? Well, he, he was he was here in the United States. He just graduated from school, and he was trying to learn American culture, and I ran into him. He was he was selling uh, ceiling fans. You and met, him, did, you met him through was, a Walmart connection, I guess? Well, he was. I, I, we left over when I left out when I was uh, in between the time that I got into the big uh, lamp business. I had 26 ceiling fan stores. So this young man, Frank Wong, sold me ceiling fans that were made overseas. So once I met him, I knew he knew about China. I sold the ceiling fan stores, and we started importing. What were the so, name of your ceiling fan stores? Well, they were called Factory First. I and, bought one. Okay. Well, the reason we called them Factory First because we, we our first store was over here behind the Sheriff's Department on Roosevelt. And... Uh, We've tried to think of a name. We said, we can't call it Factory Second, so we're going to call it Factory First. 
And you so have we done to, yeah. everything. Well, you just was, create businesses. How'd you find that niche? Well, if you know, I love laying in bed and have a ceiling fan blowing on top of me. So, you know, back you remember a long time ago that that people love fans in yes. their houses. I don't yes. know if they use them today, but uh, we we just start open, and then this is what happens to some business. So, we were we thought we were the king of the ceiling fan business, and the Home Depot decided to get into the ceiling fan business, and they sold them below cost. Just what we were talking about. Lost below. leader. Home Depot used it as a as a sales leader to bring people in, and so I. I did you I sell it, or did you gonna, close the business? I couldn't compete with them. You sell the business or close the business? I just uh, I sold off the retail stores that I had. I had some in Louisiana and Texas. I sold all the stores and just got out of the business. So you got in the car business. How did that happen? Oh, that's a good. That's your sto- favorite yeah, that's one. That's my favorite isn't- story. Uh, one of my very best friends who's passed on um, knocked on my door one day. You asked him if they'd come to my office. He came, knocked on my door, and he said, Hey, I'm J.D. Wilson. Do you remember me? He said, I sold you some cars from Moore Ford. And I said, J.D., I do remember you. He said, Well, I want to get a job driving a forklift. And I said, J.D., you ever driven a forklift? And he said, No. I said, What do you do? He said, I'm the greatest car salesman in the world. I said, Well, buddy, if you need a job, let's get in the car business. So we owe, we bought an 80-foot mobile home, and we rented some property next to Russell Chevrolet, and we opened up the first car business we called Car Plaza USA, which was a used car lot. So that was how I started in 1989, and that was my first car lot was a used car lot that J.D. Wilson talked me into. So you had your Cheyenne Silverstone company you started in the 70s. Then you started Factory First. Yeah. Then you started a car business. Is that no, would well, that be the order? I started order? that in 1989. That, I was still in the lamp business at that point. Yeah, you're still, still in still that. Still in yeah. the lamp business. That's where I, you're making. Money. I didn't know we were ever going to have a one store in, in the car business. So JD was a wonderful man, and then he said, "Boy, we need to get a new car business." So we went down to Lone Oak, Arkansas. You know, probably a population of I don't know three or four thousand. Great town. Bought a little little Chevrolet store, and learned about the new car business. And they phoned me from from General Motors from Financial, and they said, Mr. Fletcher, do you know that you're losing $20,000 a month? And I said, am I losing that much? And they said, yes. I said, do I owe you all anything? And they said, no. They said, would you mind coming up here? We'd like to see you eyeball to eyeball. So I come go over to West Little Rock where their office was, and they said, why are you in this, staying in this business and losing so much money? I said, I'm going to school. And they said, what does that mean? I said, what if I bought a big store in Little Rock? I'd probably be losing 200000 a month. So anyway, it was, oh, I had to learn the new car business because I didn't know anything about it. So, so you anyway, wanted to lose it in where property was I cheap and low I wanted to lose it as the least amount I could lose it. So anyway, I had it was like going starting all over again. So I had how, to learn everything. How long before you moved to Little Rock? So I, I, uh, I, moved, I moved in, uh, first store was in Jacksonville, uh, and it was a Dodge store. And so... They didn't have a dog store in Little Rock. So I talked to him and I said, let me build a new store in Little Rock. And we'll move the, the store from Jacksonville to Little Rock. So anyway, that was in 19, probably 1991. I got in a new car business. And since then. <laughs> How many? How many do you have? We've bought and sold 47 dealerships. Bought and sold. We have uh, 12 different stores now. But we've we've had a lot of other stores that in different states. And, I, you know, for one reason or the other. That I made a mistake, and I, I bought a store and sold it in six months. You want to hear that story? Yes, and then I we're bu- going to take a quick break. Okay. Yes, I want to hear that one first. I bought a store in Memphis, and I was really proud of it, and it was in a good part of Memphis. So I called the media people, and I said, I'd like to get a contract for radio and for TV. They said, sir, we don't need your business. Do you know about Tunica? And I said, what? Oh. They said, there's 14 casinos down there, and they're taking up all of our time, and goodbye. So they, they didn't really want to even talk to me. Right. So the newspaper was ridiculous, and the radio station didn't want to talk to me. And then a guy walks in, and he goes, you know this is the bankruptcy capital of America? And I said, surely Detroit is. And they went, nope, Memphis is. Memphis is? So Memphis is. It's so the bankrupt capital, capital of America. Of, world, of the United States. Oh, wow. Okay, go ahead. So anyway, I decided it was time for us to leave Memphis. We couldn't advertise it was the bankruptcy capital. So it was just, you know, uh, we got out of that store for the same amount we paid well, for. Well, Memphis has a lot of population, but it doesn't have. But most of the population, but this is, but the size, the size of the business community, it seems like to me, is about the size of the Little Rock. It community. is, and, and some but parts even though of the Memphis population is huge, but the products we were selling, they were 
the people had such low credit, we couldn't get them financed. Mm-hmm. So, anyway. Right. This is a great place to take a break. When we come back, we'll continue our frank conversation with Mr. Frank Fletcher. Sorry, I couldn't resist that. Entrepreneur extraordinaire. We'll talk about his passion for ponies. Yes, and why all his racehorses have some variation of the name Rocket and about his philanthropic arm. Well, we've already talked a little bit about that, about how he's using his learned business skills to empower others. He told me a story. What was that term you told me on the story? Uh, Joint and several. We're, I'm, we're going to tell that story when we come back. And if you have a question for Frank, stay tuned. Son Gray will give you the hotline number after the break. I want to remind everyone we're broadcasting live every Wednesday from 6 to 7 p.m. Central Time on 101.1 The Answer and FlagandBanner.com's Facebook page. Did it ever start working today, son? Son Matthew's over there. He's in, he's he's the tech. And that after each show's airing, a podcast is made available on all popular listening sites and YouTube. We'll be right back. Flagandbanner.com is proud to sponsor Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. The Flagandbanner.com is so much more than a flag. Everybody's not us. No, it's some other servers. Oh, yeah, it's, it's popping Facebook up server. some. Yeah, it's some other. We're going to give you an out when we get back. What you say that was called when we come back? Facebook. Joint and several partnership. Joint? Joint. S E V E R A L. Joint and several. It's joint and severally liable for partnership. Mm-hmm. Never heard never of it. Either, never heard of it either. Does he say everything that we say? It's just, isn't it fun? Every time yeah. you talk to a businessman, oh, yeah. it's the same work hard, take risks. You know, it's the same. There's no awesome. magic. There's 20 no seconds. magic. 20 seconds. 20 seconds or 12 minutes? Seconds. Oh, seconds. Oh, okay, here we go. God. Where are my? Okay, we're going to give the number. Ahoy from Flag and Banner. You're listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy, and I'm speaking today with Mr. Frank Fletcher, founder of a diverse empire of successful businesses, some of which we've been talking about today and we're going to continue to talk about. Uh, we were talking about how you can't get on fla- Facebook today, and I heard at the break that it's actually Facebook's server, so mm-hmm. it's not us, which makes me feel better that mm-hmm. our technician is not crazy over there. <laughs> uh, Frank Fletcher is so personable and so down to earth. If you have a question that you would like to ask Mr. Fletcher, you may call. You may call 501-823-0965. Okay, one more time. 501-823-0965. Before the break, we talked about uh, all the different businesses that he's that he's started, and I just was think it's fascinating some of the, I feel like I'm going down memory lane when you talk about factory first yeah. and you talk about and even before the break before the last break we talked about you working at Shakey's Pizza Parlor yep. and I mean everybody loves those stories and more than bank that's no longer around that you worked there for a little while uh, and we and we always talk about how it's you know there's no secret to success it's hard work and um, and you're paying it forward today and you were going to not forget when we came back to talk about something that you teach when you go and talk to the University of Arkansas's business department. It's something that kind of jumped up and bit you in the you-know-what. It's called Joint and Several several Partnerships. All right, tell us that story. Okay, here's, you know, uh, this is probably the scariest thing that ever happened to me in business, but I I was approached many years ago, 40 years ago, to, to... I, own, I, along with a bunch of guys, we owned a little piece of land off a rock that we had maybe $10,000 in it. And so the, this man approached us, and he said, I own 19 Hiltons, and uh, my name is Roy Cycle, I'm from Oklahoma City, and I'd like to acquire your land, and you guys can have a percentage of the Hilton, and you don't have to put any money up, and you'll get a big tax uh, check back from the government. I said, well, would you like me to hug you, or what would you like me to do? And the other guys... <laughs> We're smarter than I were, and they said, we don't want anybody. Just give us a little money. We'll be gone. So was, no money down. So no money down, and I got a big six-figure check back from the government. And you're going to be a partner so in Hilton. So I was going to be a partner in this new Hilton with no money down. I was going to own 5%, and Mr. Cycle and his friends owned the rest of it. So I didn't pay attention to what kind of loan he got. I didn't pay attention to anything. I just drove by the hotel and went, 
hey, we own a little bit of that hotel. It was Hilton's where our Wyndham is now. A lot of people remember when it was Hilton. Mm -hmm. So about 10, 11 years went by, and one day I got a phone call, and this gentleman said, uh, uh, is this Frank Fletcher? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I'm, I'm with the Republic Trust Corporation. Do you know who we are? And I went, I don't. He said, well, we're a government agency and we've taken over some banks and you guys owe us 11 million dollars and i said i think you're talking to the wrong person he said so we're going to sue you for 11 million dollars and i said sir i don't know who you are and i don't know anything about the government being involved with this but i only own five percent and he said well you need to go see a lawyer you signed a joint and severally liable partnership and i said well i've never heard of those words i don't know what that is he said well a lawyer will explain it to you so i went over and saw Mr. Ernie Harper at the Hilburn firm. And I said, Mr. Harper, could I possibly owe them? He said, yes, they can hold you liable for, I said, well, what happened to Mr. Cycle and all the other people? Yeah. He said, well, Mr. Cycle had gone bankrupt in the meantime. And so there were other partners that did have some money, but the, the Republic Trust Corporation decided that they were going to go after me. So I said, I called this gentleman back and I said, sir, we can sell our house. And uh, we don't really owe you but $550,000 if you multiply 5% times $11 million. Yes. And I said, we're going to scrape up a million dollars and just go out of business. And he, he hung up. And I called him back. And I said, did you hear me? And he said, we're not interested. So to make a very long story, story, story short, I, tr I tried to offer him $2 million, $3 million. He kept saying no. So I finally went to uh, Dallas after this went on for a year and a half. And they were going to just sell the hotel at auction. And then if, let's just say it had sold for $3 million, he would have sued me then for $8 million and, and I would balance. not have had the hotel. Oh. So since we don't have it much time, I finally made a deal with him after two years that, um, that I would pay him $6 million. And uh, I found out they had written this loan down from $11 million to $6 because one bank sold it to another bank and they sold it to another bank. And I learned that it actually wasn't on the books for $11 million. They had already written it down. So... I, I, I bought the hotel for six million, so I never intended to be in the hotel business. But because I signed a a joint and several partnership, so if Mr. Rockefeller asked you, the listeners, to sign, don't ever sign anything that's joint and severally liable because it's a bad partnership. And you said you went through all the business um, schooling. I never heard of those words. Never so heard those. Every words. time I speak to a class now, I write those words on the on the board, and. Um, one time I was taking Bobby Petrino to lunch, and he goes, he called me back after we had lunch. He said, hey, I just met you today. Would you mind texting me? So I found the law, and I, I made up a little gold plaque, and I sent it to God, Bobby Petrino, <laughs> and he still has it. By the way, he's coming to Little Rock uh, in September. For what? For the Touchdown Club. I invited him. I'm still <gasps> friends with him, and he's in Florida now. I, so I invited I... him to come, and so I think it's going to be probably the biggest touchdown club meeting david basil's ever had uh, tomorrow i'm buying tickets yeah, i'm so glad you told me that yeah he's it's gonna be something i and when never I wanted him, him to I said, leave Bobby, i want you david's my friend i want you to come do this he said frank i'd love to and i said you don't even argue about it and he said everybody in arkansas was great to me and he said i'm the one who made the mistakes he said but the people in arkansas treated me great where is bobby petrino now he's uh lives outside of orlando florida everywhere he goes he's he makes a good team well he's He's no, he's no longer employed now. Uh, I heard so, that. Anyway. All right, let's talk about uh, your horse racing. Yeah. It's your passion for it is, ponies. It is, it is what I'm doing now that I, I get really excited about. And um, All so, your horses are named Rocket. They're all named Rocket, except I had my first filly uh, that she just ran this weekend in New York, came in second. Her name is Frank's Rocket. Oh. So... I had to still get the name in. It's kind of hard to do with. How many horses have you had? I should have named it. My wife's name is Judy. And I've Judy been thinking Rocket. about naming a horse after her, but I, she doesn't really want that. Why not? No, she just lets she laughs. She's got a lot of nicknames. And uh, You can one, name one Judy Rocket. Yeah. Uh, she's uh, She just tells me to name them what I want to, but leave her out of it. So, anyway, uh, we love the horse business. We're... Uh, we have a a, 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 a manager, a young lady named Kathy Moore Howard. She used to be a jockey, and now she manages. We have mares, and we have babies every year. And we Where have, are they? Well, they're, they're, the mares are in Kentucky, 
and our horses are in New York and in uh, Kentucky, different places. We race at different tracks. How many horses do you have? Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, now come on, really? Twenty? <laughs> well, uh, we have we have more than we can afford. That's twenty? Roughly. No, we, not that many. But uh, I talk to Steve Landers every day, and I go, Steve, you make any money in the car? In the uh, I know he's making money in the car. Right here. You make any money in the horse business? He goes, Frank, you know we just spend our money on this. What well, that is true, isn't it? But it is fun. It is fun to go to the, you know, it's, it lasts uh, maybe a minute and 20 seconds, and it's, uh, it seems like a lifetime. <laughs> well, okay. So, if you, you got know, the money, weekend, are we you were, ever planning to retire? You, or you just no, gonna... I'm going to work till the day they, till God calls me home. You're very uh, religious. Yeah, well, I'm not. Tell everybody I, what I you're to doing tonight every, at 730. Well, I, tell everybody I, what you're doing I at 730. I think we're all, we're all um, parts of God in heaven, and. And um, I'm thankful for everything I have. Can you tell everybody what you're doing at 7:30, <laughs> or is it a secret? No, it's not a secret. This is the funniest story to me. He well, told me right I, before. Um, I've been baptized when I was, of course, when I was small, and then again, I think when I joined the first church early on. But I'm um, I'm now friends with a with a pastor who thinks that you need to be under the water. So tonight at about 7:30, I'm going to be baptized. Uh, again submerged su- submerged uh so anyway but, but that's not the funny part you said no pastor i've been baptized i don't want to be submerged i don't want to mess up my hair and he said i oh. said i don't have any hair when i get wet and so he said hey i'll come to your house you got a swimming pool and i went yeah so He's myself coming. and some of my friends are gonna be baptized again tonight it's your swimming pool yeah. i love that story thank you for sharing the, that thank you uh what do you want your legacy to be uh that's a hard thing to say i know I, uh, it is i i'm proud of my family i'm thankful for my family and i've always said i'm thankful for all the opportunities i've had you're a great person i have so enjoyed meeting you i have a gift for you somewhere wonder where it is well i'm Should gonna be right to your right that oh, oh here it is it's live tv or radio uh it's a desk oh, set, the U.S. You. and Arkansas flag desk set. Do you well, have one of those? That will be on my desk, I Do promise. you have one of those? No, I've never had one. I'm amazed how many people do not have a state and American flag desk set sitting on their desk. Especially well, this one will be there. Good. Think about how much fun we had on the show every time you look at it. Um, who's my guest next week, Gray? Next week's guest is radiologist Dr. Jason Beck, M.D., now, Jace, Dr. Beck is a plant-based doctor. He, he is. is a he is a vegan all the way, and he's going to talk to us and give us advice mm-hmm. about going vegan and why he thinks it's important. Um, I want to thank you again, Frank. Hey, I've had a great time. You've been great. Thank you. For our listeners who might have a great entrepreneurial story they'd like to share, send a brief bio and your contact info to me, Carrie at flagandbanner.com. And someone will be in touch. And to all, thank you for spending time with us. We hope you've heard or learned something that's been inspiring or enlightening. And that it, whatever it is, will help you up your business, your independence, or your life. I'm Carrie McCoy, and I'll see you next time on Up In Your Business. Until then, be brave and keep it up. You've been listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. For links to resources you heard discussed on today's show, go to flagandbanner.com, select radio, and choose today's guest. All interviews are recorded and posted the following week. Subscribe to podcasts wherever you like to listen. Carrie's goal is simple, to help you live the American dream. Thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. This. You are. You Thank are you. always. Yeah, it's good to meet you. Absolutely.